In the summer of 1947, the historic land of Palestine was lashed by severe political storms. All the contradictory interests which centered in the small country had flared up. The British were fighting a desperate but losing battle to maintain their power, while other groups fought to take over the country in their place. To a pair of young Arab goat herds grazing their small flocks in a valley known as the Wadi Qumran, near the Dead Sea, however, politics meant nothing in comparison with their personal affairs. Stories differ as to whether these personal affairs consisted of looking for a lost goat or pretending to do so as a cover for activities in smuggling. But whatever they sought, they found something they did not expect. The Wadi Qumran is a miserable region, wild and desolate, with scrubby vegetation apparently unfit even for a goat to eat. Rocky cliffs rise on all sides, hollowed out by hundreds of caves, which serve only as lairs for wild animals. It was into the opening of one of these caves that the goat herds strayed. The inside of the cave was dark and forbidding. One of the boys threw a stone and prepared to run. They heard the sound of something being hit and then breaking. Beyond that, silence. No goat, no other living thing that appeared to inhabit the cave. They resumed their search elsewhere. The record is vague as to whether they recovered the missing goat. The next day, however, they did return to the cave made sure it was still deserted and crawled in to find themselves between two unpleasantly closed walls. On the floor stood eight large jars, some with covers on them. Thoughts of Alibaba and the forty thieves must have crossed their minds. Hoping for Alibaba's good fortune, the good hearts looked into the jars. All were empty save one, and that contained only a large scroll and two smaller ones. With these, they left in a hurry. When they unrolled the large scroll, it reached from one end of their tent to the other. Their friends and relatives were properly surprised, but not greatly impressed. After all, paper and parchment were not gold. The goat herds made other visits to the cave, discovered other scrolls to a total of seven, and they decided that although their treasure did not compare with that of, of Alibaba, it might still have some value. They took the scrolls to a dealer in Bethlehem who examined the finds and sent them to the monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem, where they came to the attention of the Syrian Orthodox Metropolitan Samuel. Although not an archaeologist, the Metropolitan recognized that the possible value of the scrolls and bought four of them, hoping to resell them later and devote the profits to improving the monastery. Good hearts, dealer, and theologians did the usual haggling about price, but the good hearts threw in as a bonus a scrap of information which was more valuable than the scrolls themselves. They described the location of the cave to the people in the monastery. Meanwhile, the other three scrolls were offered to Professor F. L. Sukenik of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Sukenik was at once interested merely on hearing their description, but between him and the scrolls were a number of barriers. 
a cordon of British soldiers, half a dozen fighting groups, each with its own brand of martial law and bands of marauders who took advantage of the disturbance in Palestine to kill and loot. In addition, Professor Sukhanik lacked money. A large sum was finally raised with the aid of the fellow scholars who had wealthy and influential friends. Getting past soldiers, murderers, and thieves to reach the dealer, complete the purchase, and return with the scrolls seemed impossible. But this feat too, Professor Sukhanik accomplished in dramatic fashion. In April uh, 1948, after he had taken time to examine the scrolls and was convinced of their authenticity and value, he announced their discovery to the world. That part of the world which consisted of archaeologists, biblical scholars, and theologians was soon in an uproar. The different manuscripts and fragments included remains of nearly uh, every book of the Old Testament, as well as many commentaries. Specialists in different fields of archaeology, of course, have much to learn from the scrolls about such subjects as the grammar of the ancient Hebrew and Aramaic languages and the history of the alphabet. Students of biblical criticism have obtained new texts which can be compared with the text previously available and can shed light on details hitherto obscure.